Hello everyone and welcome to Chapter 3, Observing micro Microorganisms Through a Microscope. So as you are probably familiar with the fact, since we've been using the microscope pretty fre frequently this first part of the semester, that a microscope is the main instrument in microbiology. Um, not the only one, but it's an instrument that we use to see the organisms that we're working with. The types of microscopes that we use are called compound microscopes. The microscope that only has one lens is considered just a simple scope. But because our lens has two, the ocular pieces or the eye pieces, as well as the objectives below, then ours is considered a compound microscope. The type of microscopy that we use in class is called light microscopy, and it's the most common form of microscopy in microbiology. This is where we use any kind of microscope that has visible light to observe the specimen. There are various different types of light microscopes. The one that you're probably the most familiar with is the compound light microscope. Dark field microscopy, phase contrast, differential, inference contrast microscopy, fluorescence microscopy, and confocal microscopy are also other various forms of light microscopes where they use different wavelengths of light in order to illuminate the subject. In a compound microscope, we have the image um, that's going to be shown to us via two lenses, the eyepieces or the ocular lenses, as well as the objective lens. To find our total magnification, we have to multiply the ocular lens or the eyepiece, which is usually 10 times magnification, by whatever objective lens we're using. So for under oil immersion, which is 100 times magnification, and we multiply that by 10, the magnification of the eyepieces, then we have 1,000 times magnification. Resolution is defined as the ability of a lens to distinguish two points that are different from one another. So with microorganisms, they're very, very small, and you notice that when we use any of the other objectives, they might have just looked like a purple or a pink blob, but once we put the oil on, we saw much more definition. We could see individual cells instead of just one big clump. Um, so that is, is determined or called what we call resolution. A microscope that has it's said to have a resolving power of 0.4 nanometers, means that anything that's less than 0.4 nanometers apart, which is smaller than a micrometer, they're able to tell distinguishes or differences with. So two individual cilli or flagella may look like they're all just one together, but when we have a higher resolution, it clearly shows that they are two individual separate structures. The shorter your wavelength, of light, the greater your resolution. And that is a concept that I want you to maintain and, and think about and make sure that you remember for a while. That concept will come up again. The refractive index is the measure of how much light bending is happening in the medium. Light is going to bend in air so that some of it's going to actually miss what we're trying to illuminate on a microscope slide. So that's the reason that we use immersion oil. The immersion oil helps to bend the light or keep the light from bending out into the air and focus it on our specimen. Because it's making that wavelength shorter, we have a greater magnification and a greater resolution, which gives us a much clearer picture. So here's a nice uh, picture of that, and I'm not going to discuss this because we talked about this in lab class, but um, I'll briefly go over it, but I want you to take a second to see what this slide is actually telling you. So as you'll remember in the discussion that we had in one of our very first lab meetings, that the purpose of the oil was to keep the amount of light that was coming from our light source from being refracted off into the atmosphere and lost. So that the light goes through the oil instead, and because our lens and our objective is touching the oil, there's no air in between the two, then it allows that unrefracted light to be illumined, to illuminate our subject and be transmitted through the objective lens as well as the eyepiece and give us a greater resolution. Uh, bright field illumination is where dark objects can be seen against a bright background. That's pretty much what we've been using when we stain our specimens and we stained your cheek cells and we looked at the stained um, microscopes, or I'm sorry, the stained um, microorganisms in one of our first labs. The light is reflected off the specimen and does not enter the objective lens. So we kind of, that dark object was visible against this bright background. 
The opposite of that would be dark field illumination, where lighter objects, in the case of a capsule, we'll do a capsule stain for Klebsiella um, in the next upcoming weeks, light objects are going to be visible against a dark background. We'll stain um, the slide with India ink, and then the capsule will have an illumination around it, and we'll be able to see the capsule around the microorganism. Phase contrast microscopy is going to accentuate the diffraction of light that passes through the specimen. So instead of just seeing the outside of the specimen as we saw with bright field and dark field illumination microscopy, with phase contrast microscopy, we're actually able to see um, through the inside of the specimen. As an FYI, only those microscopes that we have talked about in this discussion, in this lecture, will you be responsible for um, on your exam. In your textbook, there's a lot of discussion of the various different types of microscopes and um, it's a very long-winded discussion. Only the subject matter that are covered in these notes and in this uh, collaborate lecture will you be responsible for. Differential inference contrast microscopy, or DIC, keep in mind that all of these microscopes, bright field, dark field, phase contrast, um, DIC, differential inference contrast microscopy, these are all still forms of light microscopes. But the way in which we're using the light or the wavelength of light that we are using may be different. With differential inference contrast, or DIC, it accentuates the diffraction of light that passes through a specimen, and instead of just using one beam of light, as we saw with phase contrast, we're able to use two beams of light. By using those two beams of light, we're able to get a much deeper um, and more in-depth, almost, excuse me, um, a three-dimensional view of the subject matter. Not quite three-dimensional, but it gives us... Um, we're able to see whether a structure is before or behind another structure by using these two beams of light. So here we have a picture of a paramecium using the DIC microscopy method, um, and we're able to see these large vacuoles, and we can see that there are some of these structures that are in the foreground and while others are in the background because of those two beams of light. Fluorescent microscopy uses ultraviolet light as the light source. Fluorescent microscopy is very important for um, diagnostic purposes because we can stain antibodies with fluorescent um, fluorochromes, and then we can have those antibodies put into the specimen of the individuals that we believe may have contracted some sort of infection, specifically um, different types of bacterial infections, and those antibodies will attach to the organism and they will fluoresce, and we'll be able to see that. And here is a picture of fluorescent microscopy, and we're looking at a spirochete here, which is the, like a spirillium of syphilis. Confocal microscopy, we're also using um, photochrome dyes, but instead of using ultraviolet light, we're going to be using a blue light in order to excite these dyes, which gives us a shorter wavelength. So remember from our very first discussion here about wavelength and resolution, that we said the shorter your wavelength, the higher the resolution that you will have. So with a confocal microscopy, the light illuminates each plane of the specimen, and this will actually give you a true to life three-dimensional object, as opposed to DIC, which kind of showed us things that were in the background or in the foreground, but never really gave us a true three-dimensional picture. And here's a picture of confocal microscopy, where we can actually see this is the same paramecium, but we're able to see more of a three-dimensional image being displayed. Two-photon microscopy is also using fluorochrome dyes. Two photons of long wavelength light are used to excite the dyes um, to study the cells on the surface. Scanning acoustic microscopy uses sound waves. 
that are reflected back from the object. Um, and we can study cells that are attached to the surface of another cell because it has a resolution of one micrometer, which anything that is less than one micrometer apart, we can tell the difference between that, those two objects. And now on to our electron microscopes. Instead of using beams of light, the electron microscopy and the two types of electron microscopes that we're going to discuss, we're going to use uh, electrons. Electrons give us a shorter wavelength, which will, in fact, give us a greater resolution. First type is the type of electron microscope that will allow us to see the outside of a specimen, and, I'm sorry, the inside of a specimen, and we call that transmission electron microscopy. In order to prepare a specimen for an electron microscope, specifically for transmission electron microscopes, you have to cut the specimen into very thin sections. Then light passes through the pet specimen through an electromagnetic lens, and um, there's a screen or a film that projects that image. The other thing that has to happen for electron microscopes, both transmission and scanning, is that the specimen has to be stained with heavy metal salts. Because of those heavy metal salts, the specimen is no longer allowed to be alive. So although we're able to get greater resolution, it's a much prettier picture, we can see detail um, much greater with electron microscopy, it does have its, limit, it does have its limitations. Um, the main limitation being that um, your specimen has to be killed. The second limitation of electron microscopy is the expense of it. Electron microscopes are notoriously expensive. Um, in fact, an inexpensive, on the low end, an electron microscope can cost up to $10,000. Um, and yet a third limitation of it is that it takes a skilled technician, sometimes taking a semester or a year-long course in electron microscopy to be able to use this machine. Scanning electron microscopes still use electrons of light to, um, in order to get a higher resolution and to see our image. However, we don't have to slice the um, specimen because we're not going to see the inside of it as we did with transmission electron microscopes, but we're going to see the surface of it. Um, in much the same way with both the transmission and the scanning, we'll still have to coat our specimen with heavy metal salts, and that's going to kill our specimen. Um, and here is a picture of a, a paramecium that we've been looking at pretty much this entire discussion um, that's covered with cilia using a scanning electron microscope. And you can clearly see the level of detail is much greater than we've seen with the, any, any of the other um, micropictographs. So now that we've discussed the various types of microscopes we have between light microscopes that use light and even the scanning acoustic microscope which uses sound waves in order to give us an image, it's kind of like echolocation with dolphins that they can use sound waves to um, pick up what an image is or what an object may be. Um, now we're going to talk about how we prepare specimens for the microscope. Um, a couple of definitions here. Anytime we use the term definition, we're talking about staining, or I'm sorry, anytime we use the term staining, we're talking about coloring a micro with a dye that will emphasize the entire microbe itself, or sometimes we can have staining that will just emphasize certain structures. A smear is just a thin film of the solution of microbes that we place on the slide. Or in the case of our cheek cells, it's just a thin solution of the cells that are going to be put onto the slide. We usually fix the slide with heat. The purpose of fixing the slide with heat is A, to attach the microbes to the slide so, they say, so that they don't move. And also, because we're working with microorganisms, we also want to make sure that we kill them and we don't transmit them from objective to objective to hand to person to so forth. Stains can be of a positive or of a negative ion. If we use a basic dye, and this is something important to remember, if we use a basic dye, the staining ion or the chromatophore is called a cation. Cations carry a positive charge. An easy way to remember that is there's a little plus sign in the middle of the word cation, the P. In an acidic dye, the chromatophore is an anion. An anion carries a negative charge. So basic dyes, positive charge, acidic dyes have a negative charge. So you're probably asking why is that important? The reason that that is important is because if we have a structure that has a negative charge to it, 
we want the dyes to attach to that structure. If we want the dyes to attach to that structure and it is negatively charged, then we want to make sure that we're using a chromatophore that is positively charged. Opposite charges attract. Conversely, if we have a structure that we want to dye and we want to stain that is positively charged, then we want to use a chromatophore that is negatively charged. Sometimes we don't actually stain the specimen itself. We can stain the background, and that's called negative staining. And we could use what's called dark field illumination in order to, to see that. Simple stains just mean you use one dye, kind of like a simple microscope. You just use, has one lens. Um, a mordant is something that we use to either hold the stain onto the specimen or to coat the specimen to enlarge it. So we'll use a mordant primarily with our gram staining procedure that we'll see in the, upcoming, the next upcoming weeks. Um, but we could use a mordant in order to enlarge the flagella on microorganisms. So it can be used to enlarge them certain parts of the specimen or the specimen itself, or it can hold on to the stain. Gram staining is an example of differential staining, where we use this type of stain to distinguish between two different camps of bacteria. If a bacteria can be gram stained, it's either considered gram positive or gram negative. Acid fast staining is also a type of differential stain, but instead of looking to see if it's acid fast positive or acid fast negative, we say that it's either an acid fast staining cell or a non acid fast staining cell. Acid fast staining is most useful in the, diagno the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Gram staining, we use that for diagnostic purposes as well. If an organism gram stains negative, it's more likely to be um, difficult to treat with just soaps and detergents or normal anti antibiotics. It may take various different types or certain other certain types of antibiotics to treat um, that infection. So gram stains classify bacteria into gram positive or gram negative. Um, for diagnostic purposes, gram positive bacteria tend to be killed by penicillin and detergents much easier than gram negative bacteria. They're more resistant to um, sort of your run of the mill antibiotics. So the process of gram staining essentially requires four different chemicals or four different reagents. The first reagent that we use if we have gram-positive and gram-negative cells in the fly, typically in a clinical setting, you're not sure of what you have. So if you make your smear, you heat fix it using um, heat, obviously, um, and uh, heat fix it to kill the microbes and to attach them to the fly, the next thing that you would do is that you would, for the whole side, flood it with crystal violet. So at this point, both gram-positive and gram-negative are going to be the same color. They're both going to be purple. Now, the next step, or the next reagent that we'll use is mordant, or ionide. So the mordant's job, remember, it can be used to enlarge structures, or we can use it to fix stains, or fix dyes, or to ad adhere the dye more firmly. So we're using that second role of a mordant here to adhere the dye more firmly. So we'll add our iodine, and if it's a gram-positive cell, it's going to remain purple because the iodine doesn't really change the color of the cell. It just ensures that the cell, um, the crystal violet stays attached to the cell. And then our gram negatives are also going to be um, purple as well. So at this point, we, we were to look at the slide under the microscope after just the first and the second reagent, we wouldn't be able to tell any differences between the two. Now at this point here, this is where we're going to start to get some differences. Once we add our decolorizing agent, alcohol, if we have a gram-positive cell, then that gram-positive cell will remain purple. If we have a gram-negative cell, because of the way that gram-negative bacteria have their outer membrane organized, they have an additional layer. Um, that additional layer that retain that purple dye will be washed away um, by the alcohol. Alcohol has a, a, a tendency to disrupt fat, and that outer layer of gram-negative has a fatty LPS layer, 
Don't worry if you didn't catch that this time. We'll talk about it at great length in Chapter 4. But the take-home message is that alcohol is going to cause gram-negative cells, outer membrane, to wash away that purple dye. So if you were to look at your slide under a microscope, you would have a bunch of purple stuff, and it'll look like some things are missing on your slide because it would now be colorless. So now we have to figure out how to stain those gram-negative cells. And what we do to stain those gram-negative cells is that we use our counter stain. Our counter stain is our saffron. So the job of saffron, it's a red stain, is that it's going to um, no longer, won't be able to stain the gram-positives because they're already purple, but those colorless gram-negatives will now be red. So the take-home message from this slide here is that gram positives will always stain purple, gram positives for purple, P for positive, P for purple, and then gram negative cells are red, or sometimes a pinkish kind of color, but they're in the red family. So mag red. It's not a complete true rhyme, but it's close enough. So gram positives are purple, gram negatives are red. And here we have a picture of a beautiful gram stain where we have our gram-positive cocci here and our gram-negative rod. Acid fast staining does not stain um, the cell wall in the same way that gram positive or gram staining does. And gram staining was developed by um, Hans Christian Graham. That's how he uh, that was his contribution. And with acid fast staining, we stain the waxy cell wall. Um, and if it's not decolorized by acid alcohol, we say that it is acid fast. Example of acid fast staining microorganisms or mycobacterium that causes tuberculosis and nocardia. In much the same way, we have a couple of steps with acid fast staining. Um, first, we stain them all with a primary stain of carbol fusion. And then the next thing that we use is going to be um, our decolorizing agent. Instead of using acetone alcohol, we use acid alcohol. If it is acid fast, it means that the first stain won't get washed away. If it's non-acid fast, it will now be colorless. And much the same, the gram negatives were colorless after the acetone alcohol wash. And then we counter stain with methylene blue. So the color, the end all color of a color of an acid fast cell is red, and non-acid fast staining cells are going to be blue. So instead of red and purple, as we saw for gram negatives and gram positives, for acid fast and non-acid fast staining cells, we're going to be working with red and blue, with blue being non-acid fast. And here is a picture of this where we have the non-acid fast cells that are this blue or indico sort of color. And then the red are the acid fast bacterium, um, Mycobacterium bulbus, which is the um, tubercul cow tuberculosis, if you will, the strain of cow tuberculosis. And you notice that we're using a light microscope to see this. And the same thing with our gram staining. We use a light microscope. That's what the LM stands for. So special stains can be used to distinguish different parts of the cell. We have a capsule stain that we'll do um, with India ink. We have an endospore stain that we'll use with malachite green. We'll do these in lab class in a few weeks. And then we also have a flagella stain. The flagella stain is the one that we're not going to do in class, but it's used with a mordant um, to magnify the, magnify the flagella. Negative staining for capsules, um, the cells are stained, and, or we can use a negative stain, which would stain the background, which is what we'll do for Klebsiella. Um, and here's a pretty picture of that, that we have the capsule, the background has been stained for the most part, and this little halo around it, that's the capsule that we're trying to eliminate for a capsule stain. With endospore staining, we use a primary stain called malachite green. And that malachite green is going to stain the endospore, which is a structure that's on the inside of the cell. Some microorganisms, specifically the cellist species, have those. Um, other microorganisms do not. We'll talk more about what the, an endospore is in Chapter 4. Um, but we then will decolorize the cells with water, and then we'll counter stain to stain the outside of the cell with saffron. So that the endospore is going to stain green on the inside, and then the outside of the cell will stain more of a reddish or pinkish color. And so here we have these little green 
um, dots here, those are the endospores, and then these chains of bacillus here, um, that's where the counter stain was used to stain the cell. Flagella stain, remember we can use a mordant for that, and then we use carbofusion as a simple stain to stain the remainder of the organism. And here we have the flagella being stained with the mordant, that iodine, which gives you that kind of blue-black color. And then you have the remainder of the microorganism stains with carbol fusion, which gives you kind of a redder sort of color to it. And that is all we have in this chapter. Um, we'll be doing some of these stains, and we'll be working with glam staining um, pretty soon here. All right, I hope you all have a great day.